So I, I actually want to start with some, some current news and then um, drill down a little deeper to understand the ways in which globalization is reshaping. And so we're going to talk to you, Susan, about the report. But I wanted to start, Susan, to ask you about the trade deficit. The news has been that it is much larger than ever in history. What does it look like today? And did it come as any kind of a surprise to you? Well, tonight's discussion is very topical. Today's Q4 trade numbers came out, and the U.S. trade deficit has grown to historic levels, higher than ever. Um, we still run a surplus in services. Uh, but it's a surprise, given the tariffs and given the um, policy goals of the U.S., although it's not a surprise to economists. So I think <laughs> right. both Laura and I would agree that yeah. this is not surprising to economists, yeah. that we yeah. said that tariffs... Um, are not going to affect the bilateral trading patterns. It reflects a lot of different um, things from decisions by companies to the value of the U.S. dollar. We also had very strong economic growth last year. So as American, as the economy was growing and incomes were rising, Americans bought more imports. Yeah. But I think one of the interesting things about the figures is that it really illustrates what's going on with global value chains because... The types of goods that the U.S. put tariffs on from China were parts of these long, complicated supply chains that companies have created. And it's going to take time and a lot of investment for those patterns of supply chains to shift. Um, the things that China put counter tariffs on the U.S. were agricultural goods and commodities, things like soybeans. Well, overnight, you can decide to buy soybeans from Brazil rather than the US. But it wouldn't be so easy, for instance, for Apple, as an example, to shift its production of iPhones from uh, China to a different country. So that's part of what you saw, was a collapse in what we export. Uh, but a lot of the Imports are going to be imported, you know, regardless of the price, because they're part of a larger product. Okay. And you were you were nodding. Uh, you, uh, so just take the the iPhone example. I mean, what economists said at the time is, well, you know, if you put all these tariffs on products that. Uh, the U.S. is importing from China. Many of those products are actually produced by U.S. firms operating in China or by joint ventures between U.S. firms and Chinese firms operating in China. <laughs> if you put tariffs on those things, the U.S. will have to continue to import them. Uh, there aren't a lot of alternative places to get these things from, like iPhones right now. You can't take the production facility down in some place in China and move it overnight to some place in, uh, in Malaysia. So we said, so here's what's going to happen. Imports from China aren't going to go down very much, but the price is going to go up, so American consumers will actually be worse off. Uh, and exports to China will go down because China will actually find a very targeted way since they buy a lot of thing commodities from us to say, oh, well, there are other suppliers in the world. So that's not to mention the fact that no one, a fair, there were virtually no economists who believe that the trade in balance itself is the result of unfair trading practices. The US has a trade deficit with almost all of its trading partners. The trade in balance is largely a reflection of the fact, and it saw very clearly in the last year, that the US economy has been growing more rapidly than the rest of the world. We suck in imports mm -hmm. from the rest of the world. That's in the sense of strength, not weakness. Uh, the dollar has been stronger. Again, a sign of strength, not weakness. So you could say that the trade deficit, oftentimes an increase, reflects the strength of the U.S. economy, not the weakness. And, and that, to me, is you know, the fundamental analysis of the trade imbalance that Trump has is just not correct. I'd like to get him in an introductory international economics class and try to explain this to him. But 
Anyway, <laughs> I, I never had him as a student. It used to be that you heard in the, pop, in the popular press for the longest time that the biggest problem was that they had low wage labor, and that was, was sort of, and everybody was chasing those. The companies were chasing those low, uh, the low wage labor, and uh, to the detriment of, of our own population. What does it look like now? Is uh, are wages a big part of, of what drives trade? What, what it, or drives the uh, the supply chains? Tell us something about that. That's a great question. That's really an outdated view of globalization and trade. So it was the case in the 1990s and 2000s, a lot of US manufacturing work was offshored um, in search of lower cost labor. Uh, but today, that fundamentally is not what drives most trade flows. So our research found that only 18% of goods trade is actually from a low wage country to a high wage one, 18%. That is an astonishingly small share of trade and it's, and it's declining. And the reason is automation technology. So with automation, labor is just not as big of an input. And so locating in a very low wage country no longer makes a difference. You can now, with robots, Nike fly knit shoes are made just over the border in Mexico. They're done um, mainly by machine. So the upper part is woven as one piece and there's only two pieces in total and it's attached to the sole. Adidas has a fully robotized production facility for athletic shoes. Um, they opened up uh, their future craft factory, the first one in Germany, and the second one is in Atlanta. So increasingly, um, as goods are being made through automation, you don't need to produce it in a low-wage country. And instead, a lot of companies are thinking about other factors, like is there a skilled labor force? What's the infrastructure and logistics like? What are energy costs? Because energy is a very important input. And the US with the shale rev revolution and with natural gas and fracking mm -hmm. actually has very low yeah. energy costs. Um, and they look at things like speed to market. So uh, if any of you, I'm not sure anyone here shops at Zara, but there is a, some a movement called fast fashion. Those of you with teenage daughters know all about fast fashion. So <laughs> as soon as yep. Kylie Jenner wears something, the next day it sells out globally. Uh, well, to be able to respond to those types of trends, you can't have a good sitting on a ship for 30 days coming from Asia. You've got to produce close to where you want to get mm -hmm. it into the stores. And so... That's true in a whole host of different consumer goods. So a lot of different factors are, have, have come together that are causing companies to think more about speed to market and lots of factors beyond wages. And increasingly, wages are no longer the driving influence on right. where goods are going to be produced and where they're going to be and traded. And presumably, technology is changing the whole equation when it comes to the logistics, I mean, just the time it takes, right. um, yes. et cetera, the efficiency of it. Um, what about geography? Uh, you talked about being close to market. Yeah. So one of the things that we s we've seen is in just the last few years, say the last four years, there's been an uptick in regional trade. So for a long time, trade up between regions was growing. And that was really trade between Asia and North America and Asia and Europe. Yeah. And, and Europe and, and the U.S. Um, and that gained share. Uh, but now, with some of these new factors, we've actually seen an, an uptick in the amount of trade that's taking place within a region. So that means within the EU, within Asia, and within North America. And that's consistent with this view that companies want to be closer to suppliers, that having an arm's length supplier halfway around the world is costly, it's difficult to manage, you don't really know what they're doing. Um, there could be a natural disaster, say in Japan, and suddenly the entire global automotive industry is disrupted because it turns out that one key battery component was made near the tsunami in Japan. Nobody realized this. So for a whole host of factors are meaning that now actually there are new networks of production being formed within regions, which is not to say that global trade agreements aren't important, but I think it is a different era of um, trade patterns, and that's 
great for countries like Mexico or Turkey and Morocco near Europe. Um, but it does raise question marks for another whole set of low-income countries about what's going to be their source of advantage going forward. Right. right. Well, before we turn to that, I mean, you certainly, uh, when you were in the Clinton administration, but also advising the Obama administration, Laura, you certainly anticipated um, this, this notion of you know, finding, finding trade agreements that really work for a region. Mm -hmm. um, and you, know, you think of NAFTA, right. which predated, but then was um, worked on by you as well. Um, and, and of course, under the Obama administration, the uh, Trans-Pacific Trade, uh, right, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so w was that a huge error to pull out of TTP? <laughs> So uh, again, I, I would have to say that I think my profession uh, as economists uh, from both sides of the political aisle think it was a big mistake because we, we actually, it was a very interesting uh, sort of approach we had, which was we recognized that trade was increasingly regional. We recognized that in the Asia Pacific region, we were a central player there. Uh, a lot of the supply chains through that region are ultimately were established by a U.S. multinational company. So mm -hmm. again, just to use the overused example of Apple, so much of the Apple phone produced in China is actually comes from all over Asia, right. all over Asia. And mm -hmm. what the Chinese do is they put it together and then they send it out. Um, so we had this, we had a real presence and we want, and trade was shifting, as Susan said. And so the idea of setting up some rules where it was very hard to get multilateral agreement, agreement at the WTO, but let's get some agreement on services trade, on an intellectual property trade, and on digital trade that would be new kinds of agreements given the r growing role of these kinds of trade mm -hmm. flows. Let's do it in Asia with our trading partners and then Let's do it excluding China, which will actually bring pressure on China to join in. Because, they, because how can they be? Their, their entire export uh, and import base is tied to that region, including the US. So this was both geopolitically motivated and sort of economically motivated, right? right? right. And to, to walk away from that agreement uh, had both economic costs and also had geopolitical costs. Because if you sort of think about China's uh, going forward now, they have a trade agreement that they're leading in the region. Uh, the partners that we left behind unexpectedly in TPP have come together and said, well, well, we'll do this agreement. And now, you know, it turns out that some of what's in the, I don't even know the name of it, the new U.S. NAFTA, whatever it's called, mm -hmm. the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade the agreement. USMCA. <laughs> some of those uh, pieces in that literally come as a direct read out of the TPP negotiations, mm. a direct, mm. this is, we'll just take what was negotiated there and we'll put it here because these were really good negotiations. <laughs> they led to a really good outcome. So a tremendous lost opportunity, really lost opportunity. Well, and to make it worse, the U.S. insisted on the digital chapter and intellectual <laughs> property <laughs> protections. Yes, yes, well, as soon as yeah. the U.S. left the deal, the other 11 countries said, great, we're setting those aside. We're not doing so that. So what they enacted actually <laughs> didn't have the things that took months and years to negotiate yeah, yeah, yeah. that the U.S. Yeah. wanted. And we're very mm -hmm. important given the reality yeah. of trade today. So I also want to say in general, if you look at the history of trade negotiations, uh, sometimes a, a lot of economists would prefer that all trade negotiations be multilateral because if you do it sort of regionally, what you're doing is you're biasing trade towards a region or away from other regions. But the truth is sometimes the only way to get a complicated deal mm -hmm. is to start with a relatively small number of signatories. And if they're important enough, they actually will pull the rest of the world along. So that's why this lost opportunity in digital trade, if we had done that there, I really think that would have become a model for negotiations in the WTO and the next round of plurilateral decisions or multilateral global decisions. What do you think are going to be, because what, what the Trump administration has done instead is a series of bilateral agreements. Yes. Yes. What do you expect to come out of the, uh, of, of the talks with China? You know, it's, it is hard to 
to tell right now. I think that basically one of the things that um, is going to happen here is that uh, China can China can offer, and I think uh, certainly by the pain that China has inflicted through its retaliation, China can offer real relief to the U.S. by committing to buy larger amounts of certain things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so basically so we think. will buy more sardines, we will buy more anything more that's commodity-like. We, yeah. we will buy more of that. Um, but I think at the end of the day, these really tougher issues about uh, we would like the Chinese to basically say we they will no longer have a pro semiconductor industrial policy. They're not going to say that. In fact, they have a complete right to have a pro mm -hmm. semiconductor industrial policy. The U.S. had plenty in, in the history of economic development in the United States. Truthfully, the U.S. sold a lot of stole a lot of intellectual property from the Brits, and basically used tariff protection in the U.S. to set up U.S. domestic industry. They did. We did it. So China, we're not going to get them. This trade negotiation is not going to lead to any of the sort of significant changes in the structure of Chinese economic policy, which is what we wanted. I think at the end of the day, we're going to see we'll just have to continue the dialogue, which of course has been going on for a long time in the US-China. We have had, a, had uh, the Trump administration put it on hold, a U.S.-China strategic economic dialogue. And I would say in a slow process, we have had the Chinese make some small adjustments over time. So I, I, I think that's the most we can expect, is that we get some moves for them to commit to buy more products uh, and some willingness to continue negotiating with us on the harder issues. Mm -hmm. The Lee addressed the, the National Congress. What was important in what he said and what was important in what he didn't say? He didn't mention, for example, is it Made in China 2025, that, that strategy? Right. He didn't mention it at least by name. I don't know what, what it means that he didn't mention it by name. The fact, so I'm sorry, I, so you're talking about who, who I just did so not. So this is Premier Lee addressing okay. the, the, uh, the National Congress. The National Congress. So. I think the Chinese are understandably quite committed to this notion of the next stage of economic development for them is to move into uh, more of the technology industries. Look, I, I want to start with it, just a fact of aberration for China. China is a very large country. Most large countries, including the U.S., actually don't have high exports as a share of their output or high imports as a share of their output. They're actually pretty self-sufficient. They have large markets. They generate a lot of demand and a lot of supply. China chose a development strategy which really worked for them and it was really quite distinctive in economic history of saying for a while we will grow rapidly by bringing in a lot of foreign capital by setting up as I said, a lot of what they produce in China is produced with foreign-funded firms. We'll export to the rest of the world. We'll do some labor-intensive stuff as well. We'll do all that. And then when we get to the next stage of development, we can start doing a lot of this ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, th mm -hmm. and that is what they're doing. Yeah. And, and, it's, and you would predict that. Now, the question is, are in doing that, some of the policies they pursue, as I said, are completely consistent with history and with the norms of international behavior. In the case of intellectual property, mm -hmm. I think that is a serious issue. Uh, more US firms are going after that issue in China, and more, Chinese, uh, more of the Chinese court system is going after that issue in China, but it's a very slow process. Um, 2025, yeah, they, they have a vision to become as uh, self-reliant as possible in technology industries. And I'll just say one other thing. The reason this is so complicated between the US and China is not just economic competition. This is significantly a geopolitical mm -hmm. issue because so much of the industries that they want to be uh, self-sufficient in or even dominant in are militarily relevant. 
So we, we have here going on not just a shift in the relative economic positions of the US and China, which I think is inevitable. I think it's inevitable. China is going to continue to grow faster. The US will grow more slowly. China becomes a bigger weight in the global economy. Absolutely. I think there's no way to reverse that. And I don't think we should be interested in reversing it. That's, but geopolitically, there's the other issue. OK, we're, we're the Asia power right now. China is the rising Asia power. Uh, they have a different view of what that means geopolitically. And the same industry, semiconductor industry, is really important for your iPhone. It's also really important for any kind of military technology you want to talk about. So that's why it's particularly complicated. Yeah. Yeah. And going back to the economic angle, I mean, China is already moving up the value chain. So it started out in toys and shoes and you know, cheap T-shirts. Um, but already now you see its real focus is in automotive. It's in yeah. consumer electronics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's starting to develop its own semiconductors uh, for its version of the iPhone, the Xiaomi uh, mm -hmm. smartphone. So a lot of the goals in China 2025 are just the next step beyond. It's solar energy, right. it's, it it's aerospace, it's more artificial intelligence, semiconductors, but they have already shifted quite significantly away from just being the labor-intensive, yes. <laughs> low-tech assembler of cheap consumer products mm -hmm. to making quite sophisticated goods. And this is something, by the way, uh, we as economists have told China to do and, and should celebrate. I mean, I will point out that advanced economies now export $4 trillion worth of goods collectively to developing countries. So those new consumers in China, yes, they're going to buy a lot of Chinese-made products, but they're also buying a lot of yes. potentially U.S. Mm -hmm. and European-made products as well. So it, it is a long-term opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. The, in, in your report, you point out that one of the shifts uh, is that, that we're seeing in the, in, the, in the value chain is that we're moving away from uh, the trading of goods and much more to services. Talk a little bit about that, because that, th that also has meaning for the, your earlier point about labor. Yeah, so a lot of the trade negotiations focus on tariffs on goods, and that traditionally is what was traded across borders, but increasingly it's services that matter. So when we look at services trade overall, it's growing 60% faster than goods trade. Goods trade is actually declining as a share of all the goods that are produced, and this is a structural shift we think will continue Services like business services, IT services, intellectual property charges, telecoms, Education. these things are now growing <laughs> two to three times mm -hmm. as fast as goods trip. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, they don't get a lot of press. A lot of people don't focus on this. But the, this should be the heart of trade negotiations. And even in manufactured goods, services are an important component. So think about a car. Uh, well, a lot of the value of a BMW or a Mercedes comes from the design and the engineering. Well, that's a service component that was added in Germany, embedded in the car that's then shipped around the world. Mm -hmm. Software is an increasingly important part of a car. So today it's only about 10 to 15 percent of the value of a car comes from its software, but by 2030, um, our automotive practice at McKinsey thinks it's going to be a third of the value of a car is going to be from the software that runs the car, not the tires and the, the yeah. you know, upholstery and so on. So this also gets overlooked. If you measure trade in that way, what creates value in products, you find that services are already 45% of the overall value of trade. Services are a, an area where the U.S. is a global leader. So we have, uh, we talked about the trade deficit uh, when we started, but I did not mention we have a very large trade surplus. Um, we think it's mismeasured, mismeasured that if you measured it appropriately, the U.S. would actually have a much, much larger 
trade surplus, but that's we don't want to get into national accounts here. <laughs> uh, but that's a that's a piece of good news, and it's growing very rapidly. So that is an area where the U.S. If you say like, what should we be negotiating with China? Well, it's opening up to services for mm -hmm. sure, because this is something that the U.S. Um, excels in and is very much the future. But the, the underlying trends that you've been describing seem to all be in our favor in the sense that we've, you know, we have in the past made good investment in technology. Mm -hmm. um, we, we are strong in service industries. Um, we do have uh, the ability to have a highly skilled labor force, both through immigration mm -hmm. and through training. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, who's up and who's down in the world in which... Uh, but it, I think well, that's exactly... I, you've hit the nail on the head. And I actually wrote an op-ed in the Financial Times, I think last week it was published, mm -hmm. uh, that said exactly that, that countries like the U.S. and other advanced economies stand to benefit from all of the trends that we've been talking mm -hmm. about, that um, we have the skilled workforce, we have the innovation ecosystems, we produce services, that production is likely to shift here and we stand again. So now is exactly not the time that we wanna be throwing up barriers, whether they're tariff barriers or other barriers. I mean, this is the moment I think that where a lot of the, we're gonna have tailwinds really boosting um, the position of the US and other countries. And we can come back to those low income countries that I mentioned yes. earlier that are seeing their comparative advantage of low-cost labor becoming less and less important. Laura, as yeah. long as I've known you, you've been an advocate for investment in technology, investment right. in innovation, and investment in education. Right. Is there a chance we could miss this boat? I mean, that we've got all this advantage going in, but that we could uh, mm -hmm. fail to fully capture it. So, so I, I, I do think we need to worry seriously about all this. I, I do want to, in answering that question, I do want to underscore two things that and then play off of uh, that related to what Susan said. Number one is it, it should, there, there's, should not be a zero sum approach to this. The, to have a rising technological capability of uh, the rest of the world, uh, of Japan, of South Korea, of China, of, of Germany, of, you know, countries that actually uh, are making breakthroughs in industries that are important to all of us, that, that's a positive, that should be viewed as a positive. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing I want to say is I really am worried, and we should get on to this, about the, the developing countries. Because I think this is actually, China is well positioned to move forward because they've gone through as Susan said, phases of development already, which have them well positioned to pursue this going forward. The developed countries, and certainly the US, is very well positioned. The countries that relied upon, I think I'll, the, said, said, I'm gonna follow a Chinese development strategy. I'm gonna use low cost labor and do shoes and, and uh, apparel and toys and things that have low value added. That's gonna be really uh, I don't think that pathway is necessarily open anymore because so much of that can be done locally through automation. The labor cost advantage of shifting that around the world is just disappearing. So I think this is a real serious challenge for uh, emerging market economies and particularly for Africa, particularly for Africa. Um, so now to go to the US, I think, look, these if the competitive advantage of these industries and of countries depend upon continuing to invest in talent, in infrastructure, in R&D. I think one can look at US investments in those area and get worried. One can look at, so although the investment in research and development by US companies is actually quite strong, um, the investment by, uh, in basic science support by the federal government is is significantly down, and we have to ask, and, and the budget request that, set, that Trump sent to the Congress, and they overrode him on this, they basically put in a much bigger number for R&D support than the president had requested, but there's always gonna be the issue of trying to make sure that we have enough investment in basic science. And related to that, because they're very closely linked, is the talent pool that does the basic science. The 
engineers and scientists and technicians and mathematicians and uh, engineers that, that, that you need. So I think that is an issue that uh, the U.S. is, are, should we invest, uh, are we investing enough? I don't think we are. Should we invest more? I think we should. I would like to see the U.S. at the federal government level have something like a capital budget. So when we look at the size of the budget deficit in the United States, and we say, oh, my God, it's headed towards a trillion dollars, which is not good news, and not that I'm saying that it is. But actually, uh, companies and, um, and, and states, uh, some states, could say, okay, if you spend on an investment which has long-term returns, uh, investment in basic science, and we know the returns to those investments are very high over time, or investments in infrastructure, that that's a capital expenditure and it's treated differently in the budget than just the ordinary operational expenditures. The way you would treat it if yes. you owned a building. You so would, yeah. the, the, the long and short of this is if we lose in this competition, it will be on us. Okay, it will not be anyone else's fault that we lose. Okay, China's not going to make us lose. They're investing their own capabilities to build their own capabilities. Okay, we need to think about what we need to do here for, for us. So, mm -hmm. so in, in a lot of this conversation has ended up coming, coming back to um, the way in which the nature of, of work is changing. Um, as you're looking at the industries, Susan, that will do very well going forward, the services industries, for example, um, and, and those that, that, that won't, what does it say for how, how we look at our workforce? I mean, if it's services, you care about the non-cognitive skills, right? And that's developed not in college. Mm -hmm. That's developed in the first couple of years, two, three years of life. Um, say something about the kind of investment we ought to be making there, and are we, are we now? Yeah, well, a lot of my, my work life, when I'm not thinking about globalization and trade flows, I'm thinking about automation and the future of work. And it's just a fact that in a country like the United States, to be successful in the long term, you're going to need more than a high school education. We still have a large portion of this country that maybe doesn't finish high school or only finishes high school. I mean, that's just not going to be a path towards any kind of reasonable livelihood in a, an advanced economy. So there will be jobs, but people need to have, if not a college education, at least an associate's degree, some kind of technical school or an apprenticeship. And I think that uh, middle set of post-secondary education but not college and university is where the U.S. has really fallen down over the last couple decades. Um, our universities and colleges are among the best in the world. We do have a rising share of young people who go and get a degree, although a shocking number start college and then leave before they earn a degree. That's something we should address. But it's really this middle pool of technical skills. So to be uh, many types of nursing, to learn to be a mechanic, to work in a factory. It's really to run the software that run the robots that make the goods, right? You need a mechatronics degree. So there are a whole set of professions where Companies are constantly saying we can't hire the talent we need. There are hundreds of thousands of open positions in manufacturing in this country right now because uh, manufacturing companies are struggling to find people with you know, this level of two years of, say, technical training. Um, so the jobs are there, but this country really does need to invest in the human capital. Right. You seem to be saying, and Laura, I want to turn to you because you're an educator, you're a, a <laughs> professor, right. um, that universities are not the only delivery system for that kind of education. Yeah, so how, how should we think about certification? You can't apply for a job without putting the college you graduated from uh, mm -hmm. on that resume. Mm -hmm. uh, what is a better way or another way to signal a skill set? I do think uh, it, it, you're, you're right to say right now that is the case, that a kind of the, the college degree is almost like a signal that you've, uh, you uh, can be a committed, uh, task-oriented, successful worker, okay, employee. But I do think there are a growing number of 
young people who are beginning to put together um, credentials. And you can, there are uh, a growing number of ways to do that, online credentials. Um, so uh, sometimes I, I work, I'm on the board of a big company, and the big company actually has developed a series of online nano degree programs. Uh, they are available to the employees of the company, but they're also available to anybody else who wants to take them. Uh, and you basically pay a fee and you take the course, and they're highly technical courses, mm -hmm. by the way, mm -hmm. and you complete the course and you have a credential. So you put together a series of credentials and that becomes an entry point for you. Um, and so I, I do think this is a, a trend. I would still say that it's not the dominant trend, yeah. but I do think that it's promising as a way to find more alternative ways to achieve alternative kinds of education. But I also want to point out one other thing that's really important. Um, it's not just educational opportunities, but if we think that uh, people are likely, that the credentials you might get at one time may be quite relevant to that place that you live and that uh, state of demand for your service, that over time, you may have to get new credentials, and you may have to be in another place. And this really does require a, a different kind of what I would call social insurance, because the risk to the individual person, the, in the risk to the individual is, I get my credential, I go out and get a job, I lose the job because it's automated away or it moves to another location. I bear all the income loss, I bear all of the loss of benefits, I have no, if I'm going to get new training, I'm the one that have to pay for it. That set of things, I think we're going to have to increasingly provide insurance to individuals so that when they go through these transitions, they have some support to do that. And that, of course, is, I think, what the, some of the more uh, advanced European economies who are thinking about the same problems we're talking about right here, that's what they're putting into place. They're saying, let me think about what are the risks to the individual here as the technology and globalization are changing things on a on an annual basis, on a you know, on a on a five-year basis, what do I do to provide some help? Mm -hmm. And and that is a kind of social insurance redefined because it's a new kind of system and therefore a new kind of social insurance. I just want to add that it's not yes. just yeah. education, but it's education with a set of policies to help people get the education when they need it, uh, and that's important. All right. And going back to universities, there's certainly been situations in the past where we will create public universities yes. for the purpose of dealing with a transition in right. the economy. Right. Talk a little bit about that. Because now, I mean, university for many people is out of sight because of the sheer cost also. Yes. So, so one of the ones that you know, we don't remark upon a lot, and, and I think we probably should, so we live in the western part of the United States, there's something called the Western Governors Association University. And it's actually really good. And it has online programs, and uh, the fees are very low. And hundreds of thousands of people now have been going through the w, this, this university. So basically, or if you think about you know, another uh, uh, university that is actually does, is more widely recognized is you know, Arizona State University. I mean, you know, really from any place in the world, uh, not just any place in the United States, for a fairly low fee, you can get uh, online degree in a very large number of alternatives. So I, I th do think things are moving in this direction. Some public universities will be different. I mean, if you take, you know, I'm at the University of California, Berkeley. It has historically been and probably will continue to be a major research university. So it's, it's playing a different role in the whole system. I don't mm -hmm. think it's ever going to be developing large numbers of online undergraduate degree programs. It's not its role, but I know that uh, there is a conversation going on at the level of the, of the state now of should we have a community college online degree program uh, available to everyone. So we would design the curriculum and it would, so I think that I'm, I'm optimistic. The technology can do an amazing amount at delivering uh, very high quality education at very low cost. Mm -hmm. And that we have to make the investments to do that, but I'm optimistic that 
that's happening. So. Let's go back to the developing world for a minute, um, because one of the great benefits of of trade actually is that you can mm -hmm. improve another uh, another guy's economy and that other guy becomes a big consumer of your products. Mm -hmm. You think about what NAFTA did uh, to its contribution to the Mexican economy and they're a big trading partner of ours and mm -hmm. it, it's in our interest to have that middle class grow. Um, where are you most worried? Laura pointed to Africa as, as a place we should be particularly concerned about. Where do you think the growth is going to be? Growth in middle class, we've seen it in China and India. And, and, and where do you think you know, very targeted economic development efforts are needed? Well, I'm also worried about Africa. I started out my career as a Peace Corps volunteer in West mm -hmm. Africa. Um, and so and I spend a fair amount of my professional life looking at the continent. And, and it is worrisome because, as Laura said, the, the development path that not only China took, but Japan, Korea, Taiwan, of developing this, you know, first you start with low-skill manufacturing, and then you move your way up. Well, that's coming to an end. So Vietnam and Bangladesh now have really ramped up their production of textiles and these labor-intensive exports. Some Chinese companies are setting up shop in Ethiopia, taking advantage of its extremely low labor costs. Um, so, so there is some opportunity left, but that window is closing. And what's going to be the next great opportunity to lift thousands of people out of agriculture, raise their productivity, give them higher wages. And, and there's a big question mark. We really just don't know what that path could be. Now, there's services trade. We know that Costa Rica, the Philippines, India have uh, developed expertise in providing call centers and IT support services and all sorts of what we call back office processing. A lot of it is data entry, accounting, HR kind of stuff uh, at very low wages. Um, and that's been successful for them. But all those things are highly automatable. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're going to have to continue to provide more sophisticated types of back office services if that's going to be relevant. Um, there could be opportunities. We talk about technology leapfrogging. So in Africa, they never really built out landline telephones. They've sort of jumped to mobile phones uh, because they didn't have the infrastructure. And that's worked out very well. Now we're seeing the same thing with um, what we call mobile banking or digital finance. So China's actually a world leader, but so is Kenya. Kenya. Uh, developed... M-Pesa, this mobile money account where you don't even need a smartphone, just an old flip phone, and you can transfer money uh, between people or between family members on your phone. And right now, 80% of Kenyan adults use M-Pesa to pay their bills and so on. So far beyond the U.S., we're still carrying around wallets full, filled with cash and we write checks and checkbooks, right? This incredibly archaic system. So, uh, so digital finance. Now we have digital IDs. We can look at um, online work platforms. So there are websites like Upwork where a company posts a task. It might be editing a document, writing computer code, designing a website, and workers all over the world will compete to do that work. And a lot of those workers happen to be in India or Kenya. So maybe that will create opportunities at scale. So there are good ideas, but there's not, it's, it's an unknown. And it's frightening because in addition to having to build out the roads and ports and airports, which they haven't done, and getting good business regulations and a competitive landscape that has a fair playing field, which they haven't done. Now they need to get wireless access and they need high speed internet at affordable costs. And they have this new digital infrastructure that also is yet another demand on countries that just don't have a lot to start with. So I do worry and I don't think we know what the future is going to hold. And of course, cell phones have been a way to engage in economic activity, but also to advance education, to advance deliver health yep. uh, care. It's a, it's a pretty wide range. And the, 
I guess my question for, for both of you is, what is the interest of a, <clears throat> you know, a Cisco, a, you know, of, of our companies in kind of building that infrastructure? Or, you know, more, more of a, what, what is it, Google's loon, the balloon the, exactly. approach? Exactly. Yeah. Both Google and Facebook right. are trying to bring they internet trying. access mm -hmm. uh, to the rest of the world. It's mm -hmm. interesting because Facebook in India bundled it with some of their products, and India said, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but there, you know, I think there are many groups, philanthropic as well as private companies, who are trying to bridge what we call the digital divide. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's, like I said, it's yet, it's just another thing, a challenge uh, for these countries to meet. So I'm going to take you a little farther afield, Laura, because you mentioned a digital identification system. And of course, in, in India, there's this, what we thought was a wonderful system using mm -hmm. biometrics, right. I mean, pictures of your irises, et cetera, right. Right. Um, so that everybody could have, um, have a, 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 you know, an authoritative ID, and mm -hmm. the benefit of that is everybody would get the services to which right. they're eligible, and, right. and mid-level mm -hmm. officials would not have quite the opportunity for, uh, you know, for... It, it, you eliminate the possibility of corruption. It goes from the service right to the person whose right. uh, right. ID gets... Yes. But mm -hmm. two things. I mean, one, all that personal data is sitting in one place. If uh, the mm -hmm. government is uh, becomes autocratic, uh, what what does that mean? Um, but the other thing is that I've, I've heard or I've read that, uh, that that system got hacked. And so that's a little scary okay. as well. How do you think about um, mm -hmm. these applications of technology, which I thought was something terrific until, until recently? So I, I tend to still think, I, I think we have to recognize their vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. but the world is one of trade-offs. There's no perfect solution. I think the benefit of having a national ID system in India is very high. I think uh, it does, uh, the, it's, the population is spread out. Uh, it is a very effective way to target government services. Uh, it is a, a very effective way also to enforce the law. So when you say enforce the law, then you're like, okay, do I want to enforce the law? Yeah, I think one does want to enforce the law. Does that mean that um, there are trade-offs in terms of privacy? Yes, there are. There are. And will, can all these systems be hacked? Yes, they can. Okay, I, I don't think we're going to design a system that can't be hacked. So part of this is going to be continued technological change to try to get ahead of the hackers and make the next round. But that's, that is the nature of the, of the technology. So I, that's, what, that's what I would say here. So I mean, Susan, let me add, though, yeah. that there's identity theft in the U.S. Yeah. Even oh, yeah, though sure. we sure. have pieces sure. of paper with our social security yeah. number yeah. on it, you know, in Which my we filing cabinet. To someone. Am yes. I, right? I mean, so yes. that's certainly not a hacker proof uh, system either. Right. Well, my <laughs> the other thing that's important to say here and is the world has different views on the importance of privacy. So the European view is clearly much, they value privacy much more, it seems, than the US average. The average European seems to value it much more than the average American. Um, I, I think it's important right now to think about, again, China. In the US, people are really worried about artificial intelligence, and this is part of related to artificial intelligence. In China, most people are really enthusiastic about it. They think it's fantastic. They think it's delivering all of these amazingly targeted services directly to them and platform capabilities so they can target their customer directly. And if you say to them, yeah, but the government can collect a whole bunch of information about you, they, <laughs> yeah, that's the system we kind of live in and, yeah. and uh, all things considered, we're pretty enthusiastic about the technology. So every country, I think, is gonna have to make its own determination. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see whether we can make determinations locally. I mean, you know, one of the things that's true, but it'll be fought out in court, and the outcome is very unclear, is that uh, the, US, the California legislature has either passed or has in, on the something to pass a privacy data law which is even more draconian than the one that was passed in Europe. Yep. Okay, now I don't, this will be, this will be tackled in the courts and can a state have different rules from the federal government, what should the, but a clearly 
different parts of even the United States, a country may have very different views on what the appropriate trade-off between privacy uh, and the benefits of having uh, a uh, open system where, where entities can collect data mm -hmm. and use it. You know, they're serving you, they're telling you the net Netflix film you might like or the product you might like, but they also know where you are at any time and do you really want to have that known? Mm -hmm. So those are things that are cultural norms as well as they're not just economic issues. On the cultural norms, I think what's striking in the, the Edelman Trust Index, oh, right. it measures <clears throat> the trust that citizens have in their government, but also in each other mm -hmm. uh, and in business. Um, mm -hmm. Last year, the U.S. experienced the most precipitous drop, drop. went down to number 38 mm -hmm. out of 38 countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and China experienced the greatest rise. The greatest rise. Um, mm -hmm. And I've wondered, when I've yeah. looked at, uh, at your yeah. writing and Susan's uh, writing, right the degree to which there's, there's sort of a sense that, well, the government's on it when it comes to investments in, in AI and mm -hmm. in ensuring that the benefits are, are felt um, and are having a little sort of less sense of certainty that anyone's in charge and whether there is, maybe mm -hmm. in charge is the wrong way to put it, but that there is a, a plan in place um, mm -hmm. that, that will benefit us mm -hmm. all. What do you think is underlying that? Mm -hmm. And what I'm told, what I'm mm -hmm. told by folks who work for Edelman is that the rise was because of a rise in trust in private sector yeah. in China. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say, look, it doesn't, it doesn't help that we've now been living through a couple of years of right. incredible partisan right. divisiveness. I live in Washington, D.C., right. so I have a front row seat. Uh, you know, and, and we have elected officials questioning the intelligence service, mm -hmm. Uh, the Justice Department. I mean, the rule of law and the institutions that we've built are under attack, mm -hmm. really from all sides, from the right and the left, right? Mm -hmm. So it does not actually surprise me that all this has filtered through to Americans. The Chinese system, think what you want, doesn't have dissent. It doesn't have public divisiveness. It has had an extraordinarily period of this economic growth that the world has never seen. And so the average person is doing much better off than they much were better. five years ago, right. 10 years ago, than their parents, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're feeling pretty good about mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. um, I, so I think that's where I think the results didn't surprise me. Now, I don't think it's good. And I think that in the U.S., we need to work on rebuilding trust in some basic institutions and some rules of the road by which we're all going to comply. Um, but I think that, yeah, given what we're going through, it's not surprising. Yeah, and where the angst is, is in democracies generally. So That's right. Yeah. I, and I think if you actually... I think we should also remember that we just... 2007 isn't that long ago. So 2007 to 2011, 12, uh, they were really, really awful years for most people, most of middle class and lower income workers in the advanced industrial countries. There was a great recession. That was when a lot of jobs got lost. They haven't come back. Most people still, to this day in the United States, since most of the wealth that people have uh, uh, is in the value of their property, and that has not been completely restored even now. Right. So you can see why people began to say, this, this just is not working. It's not working for it me. It is not yeah. working. And, and China... Mm -hmm navigated through that process very well. I mean, they actually did, I would like to say, traditional, if, it's as if John Maynard Keynes told them what to do, which is just <laughs> spend a lot of money on infrastructure, just keep spending money and employing people. And the U.S. and the advanced industrial countries in Europe decided not to do that. They decided, no, we'll fight the debt. And China said, no, we're not fighting the debt. We're going to keep growing. We're going to keep people employed. We're going to create incomes. So you can see how people would sort of say, if you're in China, boy, this really worked. And if you're sitting uh, at, in Spain or Greece or uh, the decimated parts of the United States, you're saying, this didn't work. Mm 
Why should I trust these officials? I, I don't trust these officials. The other thing I want to say on the trust thing and China is Xi was, he did seriously go after corruption in a very visible way. And I think that was, that's how he gained his initial gain to trust was to say, I am going to really tackle high level corruption. And, and the distinction here between corruption in the government and corruption in the state owned enterprise sector, but very visible targets. And I will control, by going after it, I will get garner trust and also create a, a, a more reliable, loyal political base. That was another thing. But I, I don't, I think that was really important to go after corruption. Yeah. Very yeah. Important. And, and before I want to just ask one of the, the questions that came from the audience, um, uh, and that was on this notion of, of allowing such a large government debt to, to emerge, such a large deficit and debt, mm -hmm. um, and asking, uh, I, I should read it to you. Um, please comment on new economics and the notion that growing government de debt doesn't matter. Is there an impact on the dollar which affects trade? Okay, so uh, I think, I, I definitely think that there's an effect on trade because I think that in a simple way, if the growing government debt, if, if what we, I would f focus on the deficit, the deficit which feeds into the debt. So here's the debt and every year if you run a deficit, you're just increasing the debt. So let's look at the deficit. The deficit at the national level measures how much you're spending versus how much you're producing. So if you're running large at large and large deficits, it means you're gonna be spending a lot on things not produced in, in your country. So that part of what we saw today in the trade numbers with China is we were growing rapidly. We, had a, we have a big deficit this year. We were stimulating demand. The demand couldn't be met by all the things that are produced here. People bought from the rest of the world. That's so, so I do think there's always gonna be a link between the size of the trade deficit and the size of the overall deficit, yes. Now the issue of this new monetary theory, which is say, I think we want to put it in context. The government debt doesn't matter as long as the interest rates on the government debt are as low as they are, and as long as the private sector is willing to buy government debt at this interest rate, okay? So basically what's happening is the rest of the world is saying, yeah, we, we like to actually hold US government securities and we're willing to hold them even when the return on them, inflation adjusted is pretty much zero. There's no return. The, the rate of return, once you take into account inflation is virtually nothing, but people seem to wanna hold them. So that means the US government is getting uh, the ability to run up its debt. Now, the, that, is true right now. It may not be true uh, some years from now. We don't know when that will change. But suppose it does change. Then what's going to happen here is that the interest rates will go up a lot. Or what the monetarists, what, what the new monetary theory types would say, well, no, then the federal, then the, 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 the federal Reserve can come in and buy the debt. Well, if that happens, you have to think about something we don't think about anymore, inflation. We don't think about it. We think it's like all gone. It's never going to happen again. A lot of, of uh, the history of monetary and fiscal policy has been volatility in inflation rates and what happens to real interest rates. So we're, we're now making this new theory up after decades of the interest rate coming down, could go up in the future, and decades in which the inflation rate has come down, could go up in the future. So it's a very, you just have to take into account that right now, it may very well be the case that the increments in the US government debt don't matter very much. Right now, that's probably correct. But I do think you're setting up a kind of possibility for the future, and this is about future generations too. It's just like with the climate. I mean, you're setting up things that will, may have to be dealt with by the future in different circumstances. Listen. Let me add, look, I think, first of all, I don't think it is a very coherent theory quite yet, <laughs> but to the extent, I think it's useful to say not every deficit or government debt no. is bad no. and scary. No. Um, in my mind, it depends a lot on what it's 
spent on. Spent on. Mm -hmm. So we talked earlier about the need for the U.S. to invest in infrastructure, mm -hmm. which we didn't do, uh, to increase public spending in R&D. Right. Federal government spending in R&D has drifted downwards. Mm -hmm. um, we need more investment in affordable education and different types of post-secondary education. So there are a lot of good things yes. that we could be using deficit spending to fund in this era where interest rates are lower than the growth rate. Right. Um, unfortunately, we're not doing that. <laughs> right. We just had a giant tax cut. The right. U.S. is now taking in. So you know, we talk about, say, Ireland is this has very low corporate taxes, and that's why companies are setting up shop in Ireland, right? Ireland's government takes in a good 4 to 5% of GDP more in tax revenue than the U.S. It has a very low corporate tax, but it has a VAT, a value-added tax worth, you yep. might know this, I don't know, 18% mm -hmm. or 15% yep. on every single item bought, right? So overall, that government has got 4 to 5% of GDP more to spend. A problem with the U.S. right now, in my view, is just that we don't take in enough money. Um, we take in a very small portion of the economy as taxes, and so we can't fund the infrastructure and the education and the R&D and so on. So at this point in time, we're running, we ran up a large deficit in debt, but we aren't spending it on the long-term investment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. priorities that I would think are important. Yeah. And that's why I mentioned earlier capital budget. That's why I think we could get clarity about this if we said, okay, here's the amount of a deficit. Here's the debt we're accumulating. Here's the amount of that deficit, which is being invested in these things which have long run returns. We can actually measure those returns. We have pretty good evidence of what they would be. And then you can measure the returns going out 10 or 15 or even 20 years relative to the cost of continuing to service that debt, which is actually pretty low because the interest rates are so low. So we could get much more clarity on this. And I, and I just want to say Susan's point about value added tax is very important because I think in this election uh, process, we're going to hear a lot about uh, significant uh, increases in various kinds of programs, which I actually support. I was talking about social insurance before, and so I, I do support more spending on those kinds of programs. And then we'll point to other countries that have them. They tend to have much higher percentages of their economy being collected in taxes and then redistributed in terms of the social insurance program. So they bring in more revenue and they push it out. It's not more investment, it's more of these existing, these, these social welfare and social insurance programs. And I'm afraid in the US we're gonna get, instead what we're gonna do is gonna say, we want all those programs and the deficit doesn't matter and the debt doesn't matter. And we have this whole new theory which is just based on the historical moment of low interest rates and low inflation. We're gonna have this whole new theory which says, oh, don't worry about that. But that's just wrong, it's, 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 it's not right, but the theory will be used to say, we can do all of this without worrying about the revenue base, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's not right. <laughs> so I just wanna ask one question that we didn't get to um, that's in the McKinsey report, and that's the impact, I mean, if, you, if, you're, if, if this is, given how much we've talked about technology and how that is affecting the cost of, of trade and, and goods and services, what is the impact for both small companies mm. and small countries to play mm. with the big guys? Mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's a bit of good news. Yeah. So good news. in this era of internet everywhere and cross-border data flows, cross-border internet traffic is like exploding through the roof. If you think about even just 10 years ago, Really, there was one big international uh, internet artery between the U.S. and Europe. And most of the rest of the world wasn't connected. Well, now we've got fiber optic cable under the oceans going everywhere. And this has enabled small businesses, no matter where you are, to suddenly tap into a global market. So through your website or through Amazon or eBay or Alibaba, a small business can start to sell its goods or services to consumers anywhere. And this is really very, very different than traditionally it was a large multinational company 
you know, like Coca-Cola or GE would sell to the world. And if you're a small company, say in Ohio, maybe you'll be a supplier to GE whose products then go out to the world. Well, now a small company in Ohio can directly export to other companies or consumers anywhere in the world. We did a survey uh, two years ago of startups and 80% of new startups, startups don't think of themselves as being a US startup anymore. They just see themselves globally. They may be using Upwork to get their coding talent. Be, you know, coding is done in India and they have a CEO from you know, Germany and they're getting funding from uh, you know, Sand Hill Road and they're, you know, they're global and they're thinking about, they're marketing their, themselves to a global audience. So this is, in some ways, what, you know, we call it the rise of the micro multinational, but anyone can now go global. Um, and, and that's, I think, that's good news for uh, both the left behind parts of the US and the left behind people we've talked about, it's good news could be part of what you know drives Africa's growth going forward. Or, and you're seeing it already. Like eBay is now a very internationalized platform. So small companies all over the developing world use eBay to export their goods to customers in other countries. Well, thank you for ending us on a very positive, <laughs> a very note. positive note. And please join me in thanking Laura and Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.